are Locked On Seahawks, your daily Seattle Seahawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, 12. This is Corbin Smith, your host for Locked On Seahawks. Joining me is always my co-host in crime, Rob Rang. Thanks for tuning in for Tell the Truth Tuesday as we do each and every week. Rob and I are going to be dishing out some words of wisdom or some hot takes coming out of Sunday's win over the Detroit Lions and heading into the season finale. Plus, we're going to take a second sneak peek at the Arizona Cardinals heading into the season finale in Arizona. Glad to have you listening in and making Locked on Seahawks your first listen every day. Now for your lead story here on Locked on Seahawks. There hasn't been much to be positive about this year with the Seahawks having a 6-10 and record, but coming off of a 51-point performance against the Lions on Sunday, two players potentially could win FedEx Player of the Week honors, which this year that would be maybe the most notable positive thing that has happened the entire season. Russell Wilson nominated for the FedEx Air Player of the Week and Rashad Penny nominated for the FedEx Ground Player of the Week. You and I talked about this before the show. I think one of the two players has a real good shot at winning this award. The other one, not so much. Yeah, it might be difficult for Russell Wilson to be able to beat out Tom Brady, considering that uh, that he threw the game winner uh, to Cyril Grayson here in the last what ten seconds or so uh, of that football game when Antonio Brown was you know waving goodbye to the New York <laughs> Jets fans and, and for quite possibly his NFL career. So I think that Tom Brady absolutely has a little bit of a, of a head up on on Russell Wilson in that regard and. My goodness, what Joe Burrow has done for the Cincinnati Bengals Corp over the last couple of weeks is spectacular. 30 of 39 passing for 446 yards and four touchdowns, uh, you know, in, in the big matchup against Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, absolutely spectacular performance uh, by Burrow. Uh, Russell Wilson does have Burrow tied for four touchdowns on, uh, you know, on Sunday. And so I think that it gives him an opp- a, a chance. But at the same time, I think on the running back side, uh, considering that Rashad Penny is going up against Deontay Foreman, as well as Ramondre Stevenson of the New England Patriots, Foreman, of course, the Tennessee Titans, and Penny ran for more yards and as many touchdowns as anybody else in the NFL a week ago, um, the most rushing yards that we've seen from anybody um, from Seattle in quite some time, a career high for Rashad Penny. I think that he absolutely deserves to be the FedEx ground player of the week for week 17. Yeah, I think Penny's going to be the favorite among that trio of running backs. Foreman and Stevenson had good games, but neither one of them were close in the rushing yards department, and Penny had two touchdowns. Stevenson did, Stevenson did too, but he only had a little over 100 rushing yards. Obviously still a very good game, but Rashad Penny had a phenomenal outing, and I don't care who the opponent is. I mean, Stevenson did his damage against the Jaguars, who have been playing much worse than the Detroit Lions. So you got to put that aside. Now, in the quarterback race, Joe Burrow, four touchdowns, well over 400 passing yards, and he did it against the Kansas City Chiefs, and they were down big in that game, and they came back and won. So I think the Bengals are playing like a potential dark horse to get to the Super Bowl in the AFC right now. They have been on fire as of late. Feels like that one is pretty easily Joe Burrow's. I think Rashad Penny is a heavy favorite at the running back position. As I said, you know, we can sit and look at these awards. Not a big deal. It's not like this is you're you're not naming the MVP or even the AFC NFC Player of the Month. Those are distinct honors. But this would still be a big deal, especially in a season where there haven't been very many positives. And I would think for somebody like Rashad Penny, when you consider everything that he's gone through, Russell Wilson's won a bunch of weekly awards in his career. Rashad Penny has spent most of his time on the sidelines just trying to get healthy and now having this most extended stretch that he's had where he's been able to stay on the field and really show what he can do. I would think winning this award would be a really big deal to him because it it would kind of be that solidifier that shows, you know what, I've arrived and I'm finally healthy. I finally can play like the first round pick the Seahawks thought I was going to be when they drafted me in the first round out of San Diego State. And so if you listen to him in press conferences, this is a kid that's just grateful to be able to play the game, but certainly it would be nice to get an award. And I think it would be something the offensive line would be really excited about too. And you know that he would be given the line credit. That's what he's been doing after every single game as he should. But 
A lot of that success also was Rashad Penny breaking tackles and creating yardage for himself. It's just been a complete package with this run game. And so it really would be a great award for all five guys up front, as well as Rashad Penny. Yeah, no question about it, Corbin. I mean, that's the thing is you're talking about with Phil Haynes at left guard who made some key blocks in that game uh, to kind of spring Rashad Penny for for some of those big plays, including the very first touchdown. Um, you know, obviously his first NFL start. You got Jake Curhan at the right tackle position, uh, you know, undrafted free agent, um, you know, and, and so it would be an award. It'd be quite the feather in the cap for, for a CX team that has struggled a little bit to have some success here in, in the 2021-2022 season um and then it's one of the things that Pete Carroll has always preached is that you want to finish strong at the very end and, and that's one of the things that you know obviously the Seahawks had nothing to do with the fact that the Detroit Lions um were one of their last opponents they were the last opponent that uh you know the Seattle was going to be playing at Lumen Field in this season but at the same time, certainly it is exciting from a Seahawk perspective to be able to finish that the way they did, to be able to score 50 plus points in that game and to have Rashad Penny, as you mentioned, obviously the former first round pick, to be able to go out with that type of splashy performance. It does make you feel a lot better about the trajectory of the Seahawks moving forward. Yeah, you try not to look too much at one game, especially an opponent that came in with two wins. But we talked about it last week. The Lions had been playing really good football. The team we're going to be talking about later in the show that Seattle's finishing the season up with, the Cardinals, they're 11-5. and five, But they lost to the Detroit Lions a few weeks ago. And they didn't just lose. They got beat badly. I mean, the Lions won that game in convincing fashion from start to finish. And so this is a Lions team that had been playing better football as of late. They were without their starting quarterback. That certainly benefited the Seahawks. But uh, you can't take that away. I I've mentioned this several times. This is not one of those cases where good NFL teams compared to bad NFL teams is like, say, the FBS compared to the FCS in college football. That is not at all the case. The margin for error, regardless of the opponent you're playing, these are the best players in the world. So even if the Detroit Lions have two wins, you're still playing – the best players in the world. And you add a couple pieces to that roster, the Lions could have had seven or eight wins this year. That's how close that margin for error is. So I just, you know, yeah, you can look at the competition here and say, yeah, there's a reason the Seahawks scored so many points. And injuries and COVID have also played a role. But I just think that that is not big of a, as big of a deal in the NFL. When you run for 170 yards, I don't think people realize how hard it is to run the football in the NFL. I don't care who the opponent is. Running for 170, two touchdowns, three runs of 20-plus yards, that's going out and having a darn good day. So uh, Rashad Penny deserves credit. The offensive line deserves credit. I don't care if it was the Lions. It's an NFL team, and it's a team that had been playing pretty good football as of late. So we'll see what happens again. I think Penny's going to win this award and be the FedEx Ground Player of the Week. I don't expect Russell Wilson to win his award. Joe Burrow, to me, is going to win this one going away. That's one where the competition does mean something to be because Kansas City's been playing great and they came from behind to win that football game. Nonetheless, both players getting much deserved recognition after big performances against the Detroit Lions. It's Tell the Truth Tuesday. Rob and I are going to be dishing out some hot takes, some words of wisdom going into the season finale, taking some last minute views at Sunday's win over the Lions. The first fans, I want to tell you about this incredible app that everyone who buys gas needs to know about. It's called Get Upside. My listeners are making up to 25 cents for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download the free Get Upside app in the App Store or Google Play right now and use the promo code TOUCHDOWN to get a bonus 25 cents per gallon on your first fill up. That's up to 50 cents cash back. Don't pay full price of the pump anymore. Get cash back using Get Upside. Just download the app for free and use the promo code TOUCHDOWN to get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to $300 a month in cash back and there's no catch. The cash back gets added right to your account. You can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app and use the promo code TOUCHDOWN to get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. That's the code TOUCHDOWN at GetUpside. You're listening to the Locked On Seahawks podcast. I'm Corbin Smith. Joining me as always, my co-host, Rob Rang. It's Tell the Truth Tuesday, as we do each and every week. It's time to dish out some words of wisdom or some hot takes, just some general last-minute observations from Sunday's win over the Lions, as well as looking towards this season finale 
against the Cardinals in Arizona. Rob, I'm going to start with you. What's the first thing that's coming to your mind here on what is really our last Tell the Truth Tuesday of the regular season? We're going to be in off-season mode next Tuesday. Yeah, I, my my big takeaway is that, I, again, with full acknowledgement, we're talking about the Detroit Lions here. But, Corbin, I think it'd be silly to blow it all up the way that some Seahawks fans and some national pundits out there are suggesting the Seahawks should do. They, they should fire John Schneider. They should fire Pete Carroll. They should trade Russell Wilson. They should trade Bobby Wagner. And I say, what the heck are you watching? You know, the, the Seahawks, of course, are going to be out of the playoffs this year. But one of the teams that they should have beaten, did essentially beat, uh, was the Tennessee Titans, who basically clinched the number one seed in the AFC. Uh, you know, I mean, that's a really good football team. The, the Seahawks played toe-to-toe with the Los Angeles Rams a couple of times, the Green Bay Packers a couple of times, some of the best teams in the NFC as well. And, and I just see a team that when they're healthy, when they are clicking, that this is still a really good football team. Um, and so to me, that is one of the things, the fact that we just started this conversation tonight, Corbin, with the FedEx ground and FedEx air players of the week, respectively, and Rashad Penny, who should win and Russell Wilson, who probably isn't going to, but still had, I think probably his best performance of the entire season with four touchdowns without an interception against the Detroit Lions team that, as you mentioned previously, it was playing. And I agree with you has been playing really good football. Ball. To me, I understand the conversation about wanting to just, you know, rebuild from scratch. But I can tell you from an NFL draft perspective, it's much more difficult than, than people want to suggest out there. And so I think this is a, is a good football team that was playing a first place schedule this year. And because of the injuries that they had, they struggled obviously, but they're going to be playing a fourth place schedule. Ty Dan Gonzalez um, for Seahawks Maven on SI uh, wrote a nice little piece here. One of several nice pieces there um, here recently, but I I think that it it really breaks down who the Seahawks are going to be facing next year. And I think there's a lot of reasons to suggest that this team could have one heck of a turnaround in 2022. That's my big takeaway. Yeah. It feels like after this game, and again, it's one game you beat a two win team, the Detroit Lions. You don't want to put too much stock in it, but It does feel like when you look at the fact they've lost so many games by less than three points and they've had some really key injuries, a few bounces here and there, this team could have been three or four games over 500 and we're talking about preparing for a playoff game. The margin, again, is that close in the NFL where if things aren't going your way, you get some injuries, you can lose a lot of those close games that you were winning in earlier seasons that had just been a bad season and obviously there need to be some changes. You can't just run everything back with the same roster that you've got and expect different results. They're going to have to make some changes. And and that's really a perfect segue into my first take here on Tell the Truth Tuesday. I think Bobby Wagner's future could be riding on what happens this weekend. That might seem like a very simple statement, but going back and watching the All-22 film, and again, it's just one game against a lowly Detroit Lions team, but I was very impressed with what I saw from Cody Barton playing the Mike linebacker spot. And when you look at his skill set, I've talked about it a lot on this show. When they played him at the Sam linebacker position, he didn't have enough strength. He wasn't, wasn't formidable enough at the point of attack trying to set the edge. That was just not the right position for him. But this is a kid that was a safety at one point. He's really sound in coverage. He's a really good athlete. And he does a good job of diagnosing runs from an off-linebacker, off-ball linebacker position. We got to see him do that several times. Clean the first play he comes in for Bobby Wagner, who gets injured with a knee sprain. First play on Sunday that he's in there, crashed into the backfield for a one-yard tackle for a loss. And he did a great job reading the pulling guard letting that pulling guard take him to where the run was going, diagnosed it quickly, makes the play. You get to see several plays like that. He had a really nice pass breakup in coverage. And Bobby Wagner, as great of a player as he still is, and obviously a first ballot Hall of Famer in my opinion, he isn't close to the athlete that he was even two or three years ago. He continues to lose his athletic traits. And that is becoming an issue schematically for the Seahawks in coverage. They're not going to admit that, but – Not having a middle linebacker that can move very well is a big problem with what the Seahawks want to do from a scheme standpoint. He can't run sideline to sideline like he used to be able to. He doesn't move as well as he used to be able to in coverage. Cody Barton, being a former safety, gives you that. And you could see it. It was undeniable on the film. I don't care who the opponent is in this case. 
you can see the fluid athleticism that Cody Barton brings. You have him and Jordan Brooks, who also was a great athlete, playing next to each other. That might be your linebacker duo next year playing along with Sam, linebacker being Daryl Taylor. Those three might be your 2022 starters and guys that are going to be out there for several years to come. And it all goes back to the cap space situation as well. $16 million that can be saved if you move on from Bobby Wagner next season. $20-plus million cap hit. Cody Barton's cap hit is $1.86 million. So if he can go out and replicate the way he played against the Lions, against a much better team in the Cardinals, I think that that makes this a much more complicated situation for John Schneider and company. Maybe you could look at it from an opposite perspective. Maybe it makes things easier, like, well, this kid's ready to start now, much cheaper, and maybe it'll make it easier for them to move on from Bobby Wagner. But I think a lot could be riding in this game that number 54 is not expected to suit up for. Yeah, that, that's the thing. It's, a, it's an excellent point because obviously the Arizona Cardinals with, with James Conner specifically, who is uh, still currently second in the NFL with 14 rushing touchdowns. If James Conner does play for the Arizona Cardinals, I'm not you know, normally in a position where I'm advocating for the opponent to play their best players against the Seahawks. But I think it would be interesting if, if James Conner does play to see Cody Barton in that type of, of environment. And I would argue the very same similar kind of, uh, you know, point here in terms of the center position for the Seahawks. You know, I, I've not been a huge Ethan Posick fan for the Seahawks, at least at the center position ever since Seattle selected him out of LSU years ago. Uh, but at the same time, he has been playing pretty good football here over the last couple of weeks. But the, 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 the difference in competition jumps significantly, just like it does at running back, as we mentioned with, jo with Cody Barton a moment ago. Corbin, the Arizona Cardinals gave up two, count them, two rushing first downs to the Dallas Cowboys with Ezekiel Elliott and a very talented ba backup in Tony Pollard a week ago. Um, in their win at AT&T Stadium over the Dallas Cowboys. Um, you know, and, and again, I think that Ethan Postick played a pretty good football game against Detroit, and a pretty good football game over the last couple of weeks. But it's going to be interesting to see what he is able to do uh, against Corey Peters, starting nose guard, uh, Lecky Fotu. You know how much I like Lecky Fotu in the inside as well. The Arizona Cardinals have given up just eight rushing touchdowns all season long. If Ethan Postick is able to be successful against the Cardinals and be able to pave some of those same rushing lanes that might be able to get Rashad Penny, perhaps his second consecutive FedEx uh, you know, ground game player of, of the week, um, then that to me would be one heck of a statement that the Seahawks do have their center of the current and the future already on the roster. And I'm going to stay on the offensive line. I've been teetering back and forth on this. If you listen to this podcast, this has maybe been one of the few times I try not to be wishy-washy when it comes to figuring out whether or not a player is going to be re-signed or should be re-signed. But these things are fluid, especially when you're talking about a player like Dwayne Brown, who has consistently been one of the best left tackles in the NFL. And then the first half this year was one of the worst in the NFC, was really struggling in pass protection. But you bring up Ethan Posick, ever since they made the switch at center and took Kyle Fuller out of the lineup, Dwayne Brown has reverted, maybe not back to his former self, but he's been much better. And I thought he had his best game in pass protection this past weekend. Again, Detroit didn't have a ton of pass rushing weapons. They did have Charles Harris, but still, Dwayne Brown has played much better over the last four or five games. His run blocking has been sound. He's been protecting the quarterback. Two of the sacks he's given up, I think, are on Russell Wilson for holding on to the ball too long. I thought Dwayne Brown did his job. So my second take here. I am now to the position where I am very confident with the, I am confident in the Seahawks giving Dwayne Brown a one-year deal for the 2022 season. At his age, I'm not giving him multi-year contracts. I'm taking this like the Rams have done with Andrew Whitworth, and I'm going year to year and just a, a bunch of really short stoplights and just see where we're at when we get there. But I think at this point, I'm confident in bringing him back for a fifth season in Seattle, and I think he can still get the job done. Oh, I 100% agree. Uh, and that, that's the thing is that, uh, you know, 
you know, I, I've been asked to be on this podcast in part because of I mean, the the analysis I hopefully can provide you from an NFL draft perspective. And and I'm intrigued by the young tackles this year, Corbin. But at the same time, I don't know that any of them are able to kind of step in um, and, and play at the at the level that Dwayne Brown has played cons- pretty consistently, uh, you know, throughout his time in Seattle and obviously previously in, in Houston. So to me, that would be a, 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 a decision I think that would make a lot of sense. Uh, for the Seahawks, and I think a big part of that, and that kind of goes into to another point that that you and I feel I think are are both very strong on, and that is that the Seahawks have seen some really intriguing play in the very small snippets that they've seen from Phil Haynes. So to me, while we want to talk about what Cody Barton might be able to do with a big time, uh, you know, a, opponent this week against the Arizona Cardinals, certainly um, with Ethan Posick as well, I want to see Phil Haynes be able to continue that play. I don't care if Damian Lewis is ready to play. I want to see Phil Haynes get some opportunities and improve that that he should be somebody that Seattle is going to make a priority to bring back. Yeah, it's interesting that we're having this discussion because to me, and some might consider this a hot take, but I think you have got to find a way to get Phil Haynes in the lineup in 2022. And I was saying it before this season, whether that's putting him at center and trying him out there, moving Damian Lewis to the center position, maybe you bench Damian Lewis. I mean, he has struggled this year, and I know there have been injuries, but He's been one of the more disappointing players on this roster this year. I had really high expectations for him after how well he played as a rookie. And I do think health has played a part. He's had shoulder issues, elbow issues. He had a cyst removed from his groin. He's had COVID. I mean, it's been a really rough season for him. So I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. But you have got to find a way to get Phil Haynes, at least give him a legitimate opportunity to compete for a starting job. He wasn't going to get that with Gabe Jackson coming in. You've extended Gabe Jackson. He's going to be your guy for the next several years, right guard. But whether it's left guard or center, I think you got to find a way. Phil Haynes played fantastic football on Sunday. And again, it's just one game, but I've watched this kid in training camp. I've seen what he can do in preseason games. I thought he had a great preseason. This is a kid that deserves the opportunity to play. And he's a road grader. He can move people and he's a pretty good athlete for his size. So you got to find somewhere to play him. That would be my last takeaway here from this game is you got to find a way to get number 60 in the lineup. And I don't care how you make it happen, center or left guard, he needs to be playing for the Seahawks next year as part of an offensive line that's honestly probably not going to look that much different because I think Jake Curhan has positioned himself to be the starter at right tackle next season, bringing some competition. But uh, they could have a line that has quite a bit of continuity despite the fact they had a lot of changes this year in and out of the lineup. I just think Phil Haynes is the guy that, as long as he can stay healthy, that's been the biggest problem for him. You can keep him in the lineup, he should be playing. I just think this kid has too much upside and too many good qualities in pass protection and run blocking. He didn't give up any pressures on Sunday in pass protection. I want to see more of this kid, so I agree with you. Damian Lewis, if you're not 100% healthy, we're going to throw Phil Haynes out there. He's going to start a second straight game to end this season. Let's see what we got in this kid. Jake Curran still going to be at right tackle. You might have a few starters ready to go that are already on your roster for 2022 without having to worry about that too much in free agency. We're going to talk Arizona Cardinals here in a moment. Bet Online has you covered this holiday season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football continues its march through the college bowl season and the pro football playoffs. Bet online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head to the website or use your mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use the promo code Locked On to receive your bonus from basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports. So don't wait to take advantage of all the new amazing offers available. Bet online where the game starts. You're listening to the Tuesday edition of the Locked On Seahawks podcast. I'm your host, Corbin Smith, joined as always by Rob Rang. The Seahawks preparing for their final game of the 2021 season, as we've known for several weeks. No playoffs coming for the Seahawks. This is their Super Bowl. They get to potentially play spoilers. This is a game that has some significance for the Arizona Cardinals because if the Rams lose their game to the 49ers and the Cardinals win, the Cardinals are division champions. If the Cardinals lose this game, the Rams are going to be division champs no matter what. So there is a lot riding on this game in Arizona. The Seahawks have not had much go their way this season, but 
they can finish on a strong note potentially and prevent a division rival from getting a home playoff game. Yeah, and the Seahawks can finish 500 in the division. And you know that Pete Carroll is absolutely championing that idea as well. Um, you know, so that to me is one of the reasons why this is a fascinating game, Corbin. I mean, you know, again, the Arizona Cardinals are a supremely talented team. But you go back to, um, you know, their, their game against the Seahawks earlier this season. It's a completely different team. Um, you know, when, when Arizona was able to win previously, it was with Colt McCoy, not Kyler Murray. Uh, at the quarterback position. Um, obviously, Seattle has completely changed the way that it's running its offense. It's, it's basically going through Rashad Penny, who had two carries uh, against the Arizona Cardinals that last time. And again, two is a, is a critical number because, as I mentioned earlier, the Arizona Cardinals gave up only two first downs to the Dallas Cowboys in, the, in terms of their running game. So if Seattle is going to have any effectiveness whatsoever, at least the way that they have done here recently, then they're going to have to kind of flip the script against one of the league's most stout run defenses. As I mentioned previously, again, the Arizona Cardinals, they are tied with the New England England Patriots, Corbin, just eight touchdowns allowed on the ground so far this season. So if Seattle is, in fact, effective uh, on the road, um, you know, running the football against Arizona, they truly are going to have to earn it. And so Ethan Posick's the, the, you know, the Phil Haynes, the Damian Lewis, whoever, the Jake Curhans, they're going to have to earn it. And so that, to me, is one of the reasons why this game truly is fasting, because there is surprisingly a lot on the line for the Seahawks. There certainly is a lot on the line for the Arizona Cardinals, as you mentioned, very much going for playoff C and perhaps being the NFC West divisional champs. Yeah, and again, the Seahawks would love nothing more than to ruin that for the Arizona Cardinals, especially because they lost to Arizona earlier this year with Colt McCoy at quarterback. I keep calling it the curse of Colt McCoy. He's 3-0 and against the Seahawks with three different teams. They just haven't been able to beat teams quarterbacked by him over the years. But Kyler Murray's back, obviously a much better player than what Colt McCoy is. But Murray's had his struggles since he returned from an ankle injury that kept him out in that game, played fairly well last week against the Cowboys, but he's had a couple rough outings since coming back. This is an offense that now is ranked 11th in points per game. They were in the top five the last time these two teams met. So they haven't been putting as many points to the board, and that's one of the reasons they had three straight losses, including a loss to the Detroit Lions where the offense did not play well at all in Detroit. So this is a group that's kind of been reeling a little bit. Last week was a game they absolutely had to have bouncing back. Let's look inside the numbers a bit. With this Cardinals team, we do this week in, week out. We've already looked at Arizona, but they are a much different team with DeAndre Hopkins on injured reserve. They've got a number of other key players that are out. This is a team that's winning games a little bit differently than what they did early in the season. I would start on offense, as I mentioned, with Kyler Murray being kind of inconsistent by his standards recently. One thing that has been consistent, the Cardinals have converted 44.8% of their third down conversions. That is still the fifth best rate in the NFL. It was fourth best when these two teams played. Last time where we have seen a dip has been red zone efficiency, which has dropped down to 61.3% touchdown rate in the red zone. That is 11th, a respectable 11th, but they were third the last time these two teams met. So that's been part of the problem why the Cardinals have lost three of their last five games. They haven't been able to finish drives the way that they were early in the season. Yeah, and that's a big part of that is the DeAndre Hopkins factor. And DeAndre Hopkins did not play against the Seahawks, but still his his production was very much part of the statistics that uh, that led the Cardinals to having such, you know, kind of lofty numbers uh, in Seattle's previous matchup. Um, you know, another significant factor has been just what Zach Ertz has provided for the Cardinals and the fact that, that Rondale Moore, kind of like uh, – James Conner, that he's considered to be questionable at this early stage uh, of the week. It would make an awful lot of sense from a Cardinals perspective to to preserve James Conner, preserve the electric receiver Rondale Moore, who you know had one of his best performances so far in this twenty twenty one NFL season. Corbin as a rookie, uh, he had a spectacular performance against the Seahawks. Actually led the Cardinals in receptions and receiving yards. So to me, those are some of the factors of why this again is a very different Cardinals team that the Seahawks are going to be facing uh, this weekend. A couple other numbers of note since week 12 when Kyler Murray returned from his injury 
He's thrown just six touchdown passes. That's tied for 17th in the NFL. So again, he's had his issues since he came back, did play well last week. They're hoping he's hitting his stride at the right time going into the postseason. And 187, that's the number of quarterback pressures that the Cardinals have allowed. And right now that is currently ranked 23rd in the NFL or ninth fewest. So in the past, the Cardinals have had their issues protecting the quarterback. Even with Colt McCoy back there, that has not been an issue this year. The Cardinals schematically have helped avoid those pressures by getting the football out quickly, but the offensive line has also been much better. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, the Cardinals are still ranked fifth in points per game allowed. This is a defense that has continued to play well all year long. A lot of really good young players at all three levels, two elite pass rushers in Chandler Jones and Marcus Golden. The one thing that has changed, though, Robin, and we saw this a little bit in the Detroit game when they lost to the Lions, gave up some passing touchdowns. They have now given up 27 passing touchdowns this season, and that is 21st in the NFL. When the Seahawks played the Cardinals early this year, the Cardinals were in the top 10 for fewest touchdown passes given up. So their secondary, they've kind of hit a little bit of a wall in the second half, and Russell Wilson coming off a big game, he's got to be thinking – you know what? This might be an opportunity. This is a young secondary that hasn't been playing as well. I might be able to play with some house money here and get some big plays. He could, you know, I mean, obviously with DK Metcalf coming off the very first uh, three touchdown performance of, of his career, uh, you know, Tyler Lockett to, you know, oh, by the way, scored a touchdown as well, even though that he was basically just kind of a, you know, just a secondary factor for the Seahawks. You, you just kind of can sense that, that Seattle has a little bit of momentum. Obviously, this is the end of the year, as you talked about before, they would love to send Arizona back to the locker room with a loss and just kind of even up the series uh, right here. But, you know, when, when you think about that Arizona secondary, Corbin, there's a lot of really highly drafted players, a lot of really yeah. good talent there. At, at the same time, it's one of the knocks that a lot of people have had about the Seahawks over the years is that when Seattle has really been dealing, when Russ has been cooking, so to speak, and they've been able to get some of those big splash plays, they haven't given their big guys on the defensive side of the ball much time to breathe. And so before they're back on the field, and and so that's one of the reasons why they give up a lot of big plays. The same thing here with the Arizona Cardinals. Cliff Kingsbury is a terrific coach when it comes to generating points. He's not quite as effective when it comes to giving up points. I think that goes back and to his clock college management. Days. Exactly. And so that's the thing is that this could be a shootout. This could be one of those barn burner kind of games because the Arizona Cardinals are very good at stuffing the run, but they also give up a lot of plays over the top. It's kind of one of those conversations where you say you live by the sword, buy by the, die by the sword. The Arizona Cardinals live by the pass, but die by the pass as well. What's interesting is the Cardinals, when these teams met earlier this year, they were one of the worst teams defending the run in the NFL. They've gotten better over the last five or six weeks. They still are giving up 4.4 yards per carry, which is in the bottom half of the NFL, but they have improved their overall rush defense. And part of it is teams have to throw the ball to play catch up. But this is still a team that I think you can run the ball on. They've given up passing touchdowns. The one thing they have not done is give up explosives. Just 37 passes of 20 or more yards this year. That is the third fewest in the league. So the secondaries continue to do a good job of bottling up those big explosive pass plays. They've done a better job against the run, especially last week against the Cowboys. And they've also been able to pressure quarterbacks because of Golden and Jones, who have 81 combined pressures between the two of them. Neither one of them in the top 30 in the NFL, but as a combined duo, one of the more fearsome pass rushing partnerships that you're going to find in the NFL. And of course, anytime we're talking about the Seahawks and their offensive line, that's the number one thing when you play the Cardinals. Can you prevent Chandler Jones and Marcus Golden from taking over the game by getting to Russell Wilson early and often? If you're able to do that and you can run the ball some, you can score points against this Cardinals defense. It's just going to be a much tougher test than what they had last weekend against a very shorthanded Lions squad. Yeah, but the Cardinals have one of the best set safety uh, duos in all of the all of the NFL, at least in my opinion. The former uh, UW Husky, Buda Baker, the former Washington State Cougar, and, and Jalen Thompson, um, they really do complement each other very, very well. They both have speed. They both have the instincts, and they're both very good open field tacklers. And because of that, as well as the pass rush that you just highlighted a moment ago, 
that's one of the biggest reasons why they have not surrendered very many big plays. So again, all the more reason why I think it's really going to be a fascinating matchup for Seattle. They're going to win this football game. They're going to have to be able to run the football, something that Arizona's done a nice job of slowing down here recently. They're also going to have to allow Russell Wilson to be able to create some big plays over the top. At least that's been Seattle's recipe for success here in the past. Both of those would be a big deal against the Arizona Cardinals team that has been very effective in both of those. So both of those factors. So that to me is again, it, has Seattle improved or was this just a fact that you're going up against some, some pretty poor opponents here recently? This is one heck of a test in week 18. As always, thanks for making Locked on Seahawks your first listen every day. Now make sure to make Locked on Bets your second listen, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked on Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. You can follow me on Twitter at Corbin Smith NFL. You can follow Rob at Rob Rang. Check out Locked on Seahawks on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the all-new Odyssey app. That's AUD. ACY coming up tomorrow. Last time this season, it's matchup Wednesday. We'll be breaking down all the key matchups to watch when the Seahawks and the Cardinals tangle for their rematch at State Farm Stadium. You won't want to miss it. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. Thanks for listening. Go Hawks.